Good morning, everybody, and can I just bid you the warmest of welcomes to our service of worship here in Ballyrooney and Drumlee this morning. If you are joining in with us or, or watching us for the first time, we are delighted that you're able to do that, and we bid you the warmest of welcome. And we just pray that we will all be blessed as we worship our great God together and as we listen to his voice from the teaching of his word. So we are going now to our call to worship. And the call to worship this morning may be a wee bit long, but it's Psalm 139, the first 10 verses. And the psalmist writes these words, and they're very, very challenging words. The psalmist writes, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I free, flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, Behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Friends, God is everywhere and he is our great presence in every place and at all times. So, we, are, we have such a wonderful God. We are now going to lift up our voices and sing our first hymn of praise to him.
Let us now come before the throne of grace and seek God's face in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, at this morning hour, we come before your throne of grace because we know we come before our great and awesome God. And we come, Father, trusting no merit of our own, but simply trusting in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, we just come to praise you and worship you and to thank you for being our God. We come to thank you and praise you for your grace and mercy towards us in sending your only beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to take on a body of human flesh and to come seeking that which was lost, which, is, which was us. And so, Father, this morning we come primarily to worship you and to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed Saviour. And we come to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are now our great High Priest, seated at thy Father's right hand in the heavenly places, ever interceding for us. And we come also to worship you because you sent the Holy Spirit of God, the third blessed person of the Trinity, to come and dwell within the hearts of all who have put their faith and trust in thee. And we come, Father, confessing before your throne this morning and asking forgiveness for the sins that we have committed in the week that has just passed. Father, we have taken our eyes off Jesus. We have looked on the world and all its problems, and we have, we confess, been discouraged. At times, Father, we have neglected to, to bring it all before our Lord in prayer. We have neglected to, to read your word, perhaps, Father, we are a wandering people and we just pray that you will forgive us and cleanse us as the, you, you have promised through your servant John that you are just and faithful and that you will cleanse us from all our iniquities. Father, this morning too we come to bring before you our service of worship, just praying for your Spirit's presence with us leading us and guiding us, open up, uh, opening up our hearts to the precious truths contained in your word. Father, may you challenge us and may you also speak to us and encourage us and lead us and guide us as we deliberate and think on your word this day. We bring before you also those, Father, who cannot be with us because of sickness or age and infirmity. We just pray that you will go to them because we know you're present yourself everywhere. And, Father, that you will be to them all that they need this day. We also ask, Father, that you would comfort those who are sorrowing at this time, those who have been bereaved, that they would know your very special close presence and your everlasting arms around them. Father, too, we just pray for our land today, still ravaged by the coronavirus. And we just pray, Father, that you would help those who are seeking to bring relief that you would be with all our medical services and all our key workers, that you would extend your gracious hand to protecting them. And Father, for those who are suffering from, from the virus, that you would, in your grace and mercy, restore them again to health and strength. And especially we pray for the medical scientists who are working to try and find an effects of effective vaccine for this disease. Father, we look to you now with great expectation 
And we ask that you would, as we open up your word in a short time, that you would speak very clearly into each one of our personal situations. Father, we pray these things in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now we, we are going to go, folks, to kids' church. So boys and girls, if you would like to take a seat, and we will bring you a word today. So boys and girls, it's lovely to be able to talk to you again. And uh, a little bit later, I will be looking at a passage of scripture from the book of Exodus, which talks very much about frogs. So I'm going to talk to you a wee bit about frogs, but let me read a verse of scripture for you first of all before I do that. The verse of scripture I have for you is James chapter 1, verse 26. And the verse says, James said, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue he deceives himself and his religion is worthless now you might be thinking what on earth has that verse got to do with frogs so let me explain we all have this little member as as uh, our, our part of our body which we know as our tongue and boys and girls if we didn't have a tongue we wouldn't be able to talk if I hadn't my tongue I wouldn't be able to talk to you now but I wonder have you ever considered you what way your tongue is mounted in your mouth or in part of your body your tongue is attached to your lower jaw and it then comes out towards the tip of it being just inside your your mouth and that enables us, boys and, girl, when, boys and girls, when we move the tongue in a certain way, that enables us to make sounds and be able to talk and communicate with one another. It's, it's one of the marvelous ways that God has made us. But that's, that's all right. That's for humans. I wonder if you've ever maybe in a nature study or part of your school learning, have you ever considered a frog what way its tongue is? See, it's the opposite way round to ours. A frog's tongue is mounted just inside its lip and it points back down towards its throat. It's the complete opposite to our human tongues. And why is that, do you think? Well, you see, frogs... They, they, their food or their diet is little insects and, and the like. That's what they live on. And if their tongue was mounted the same way as ours, it wouldn't be long enough because it's not overly long. It wouldn't be long enough to stretch out. But you see, a frog's tongue is mounted the, the complete opposite way. And this again is the wonderful creation power of God and on a frog's tongue, it has a sticky substance. And whenever the frog sees some juicy insect, something that it likes to eat, it simply flicks the tongue out because it's mounted just immediately inside its lip. And it flicks the tongue out and the insects stick to the, to the sticky substance on their tongue and it flicks it straight in again and yum, yum, the the, th the insect has become part of their food for that day. That might sound a wee bit unappetizing to us, but boys and girls, I assure you that that is very pleasing for the frog. But leaving the nature study part of it aside for a wee minute, let's consider what God is saying to us from all this. You see, James here is warning us about the careful use of our tongues. 
this tongue that we have for, for being able to talk to each other, is it not true to say because of the sin that, was, that is inherent within us that you know, sometimes we use our tongues to say wrong words. We, we can use our tongues in a way that hurt other people. You know, or we can use our tongues to gossip about other people, which is not very nice and it hurts them very badly. So James is simply telling us, be careful how you use your tongue. And you know, that is a great lesson to learn in life, even from the time that you're very young. Because if you can learn the discipline of controlling your tongue when you're young, you'll find that that discipline will go with you on into adult life. And you'll find, if you trust Jesus as your Savior, that the Holy Spirit of God, he will help you to control your tongue. And you, you'll be able to go out and when you see someone who is sorrowing, that you'll be able to speak words of comfort. If you see someone who is struggling, you'll be able to go over and speak a word of encouragement to them. You know, and people will look to you and people will listen to you. They will respect your words very much. Boys and girls, I just pray that this simple little lesson about our tongues that we will be like the frog who used, uses his tongue to such great effect for to, to bring in his food, that we'll use our tongues through this life to be a real blessing to others. Because if we are a blessing to others in the way that we talk, then God will become a great blessing to us. Thank you very much for listening so well. And now we will sing your hymn of praise. Thank you. Shine from the inside out That the world will see you live in me Shine from the inside out that the world will see you live in me you know me and you love me you feel me so send me to shine from the inside out that the world will see you live in me shine from the inside out that the world will see you live Now we are going to turn to God's Word, and our Bible reading today is from Exodus chapter 8 and the first 15 verses of the chapter. This is the, the account of the second of the ten plagues that the Lord sent upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt before he 
let, he released the Israelite people from slavery and bondage. So let's turn our hearts and attention to God's word. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house and into thy bedchamber and upon thy bed and into the house of thy servants and upon thy people and into thine ovens and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may, may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses that they may remain in the river only? And he said, Tomorrow. And he, and he said, Be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frog shall depart from thee and from thy houses and from thy servants and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought up against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Amen. And we know that God will indeed add his blessing to the public reading of his precious truth for his name's sake. Today, this story I'm sure you are familiar with if you have been reading the Old Testament and the book of Acts in particular. You know that the, the that Joseph was sold as a slave into Egypt and his father Jacob, sorrowing, thought that because of the deception of, of Joseph's brothers that he had been killed by a, a, a wild animal. <clears throat> but as the story goes forward, the, the, God sent a great famine into the whole lands round about and Joseph's brothers were sent to Egypt you know, because of the, the providence of God working in that land and through the knowledge that he gave to Joseph to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, there was this great plenty of grain and eventually Jacob and all his household went to Egypt and as time went on, that Pharaoh died and a much more cruel one came along and he put the children of Israel who had multiplied then to over a million people into, into hard labor and bondage and held them as slaves. God then appeared to Moses at the burning bush in the desert 
beside the mountain of Horeb and told him to go, go back to Egypt and Aaron, his brother, would go with him and they would be his chosen in instruments to bring his people out. So this is where we are. That's the context. And the first plague that was sent was turning the rivers and all the waters, drinking water, etc., into blood. That didn't work. So now we're at plague number two, and God covered the land with frogs. But I'm just going to take four words out of one of the verses and it's verse 10 in this passage. And I'm going to take four words that that pagan ruler Pharaoh said after Moses asked him, when do you want me to plead with the Lord to take away all these frogs? And Pharaoh turned around to him with a real, I, I, I can only but imagine, arrogant and angry look and said, he said, tomorrow and he said tomorrow that's the exact words of the text i want to take here and i want to let uh, have us look at this to see what those words of pharaoh a cruel pagan king spoken all those years ago what those words would say to us today from the word of god because trust me friends this precious book the bible is living and powerful it's sharper than any two-edged sword it can it can discern the thoughts of the heart it can divide the very joints and the marrow within the human body and those four words spoken so many years ago have a lot trust me to say to us and the situation that we find ourselves in in the year 2020. Three points that I would draw your attention to here. The first one is divine intervention by God was on offer. That's the first thing. I think it's important that we should return to that original context which I've been laying out the land of Egypt was now starting to experience a ravage of plagues that God was inflicting upon them because of the hardness of the heart of their ruler and king. Because he simply refused to recognize God. In the previous plague, he says, who is the Lord that I should hearken unto his voice? You know, and today in the world that we are living in, that's what a lot of people are saying. Who is this God you Christians are talking about? We don't see any evidence of him. You know, this is a world that man has complete control of. That's what people are saying. You know, and we as believers today are despised in the eyes of so many people. And we try with the best grace that we know to explain to them who God is and what is going to become of this world, or more importantly, what is going to become of their souls if they die not trusting in, in the precious Son that God sent to procure their salvation. But let's go back to Pharaoh for a minute or two. You know, this, as I say, was the second plague that, that Pharaoh had sent. The first one, his own magicians and diviners were able to replicate. They were able, to, interestingly, to replicate this one to an extent as well. But uh, there's a progression in these plagues, friends. You know, each plague brought more hardship and more severity to the people as they progressed they had to dig uh, around the, the regions of the river to find and just about enough drink and water to drink to keep them alive that wasn't contaminated with blood in terms of the first plague. So now, just to try and paint a very brief picture here, slimy, croaking, large frogs everywhere. Just try to imagine that. 
Imagine your house being invaded by a plague of frogs. You run up the stairs to get a bit of respite from downstairs and you run into your bedroom and they're everywhere. You run into your bathroom, they're everywhere. You know, and then you slip and you, you tramp on one and you slip and fall maybe. You know, it is unbelievable the situation that these people find themselves in. And quite naturally, they cried out to their king, Oh, king, do something about this. Please help us. We are absolutely destroyed and so is our homes and all that we possess by these, these frogs. Please, king, please, oh, king, speak to these men who seem to have the power of bringing these things upon us that we, they would take them away again. You know, any good leader of a land should listen to the voice of his people. It is a, a dire sin and a dire dereliction of duty for any God-appointed ruler. And let's face it, all rulers are appointed sovereignly and ultimately by God. It is a, it is a dire dereliction of that leader's duty to ignore the plight and the cries of his people, especially in a time of crisis. That's where we are at the minute, folks. We're in a time of crisis in the world, in our own land. We are in the midst of a global pandemic. And we desperately need good, responsible leadership from the government of our land, from our rulers at a time like this. But let, let me not, I don't want to take you away from the focus of Pharaoh at the minute. Eventually, Pharaoh started to get the message because the frogs were as much of a plague to him as they were to his people. And he called for Moses and Aaron, and when, he, when they come in, and he says, basically, take the frogs away, and I will let your people go. And I suppose initially Moses and Aaron thought, you know, he's going to relent. And they asked what seemingly would be a strange question. When shall I pray to the Lord to take these frogs away, Moses says. You know, you would have thought it would have been done in haste. You would have thought certainly Pharaoh would have said, as soon as you can possibly get rid of them, please do so. But no, no, no. Here we get a, a, an insight into the mind of this man. You know, when shall I pray to the Lord for you? And he said, tomorrow. In other words, in total and complete arrogance, you know, I, I don't care for your God. In fact, I don't even believe your God is responsible for this. You know, what do I care about your God? Tomorrow, tomorrow's time enough. Pray to him tomorrow. Consider for a minute or two the life and example that this pagan king was living. He was proud, he was arrogant, he was self-sufficient. Some would say that that would be expected in a leader, especially in such a powerful na nation as Egypt was at that time. They were the most powerful people in the world. But I say to that, more reason, all the more reason why this man should start to consider that there really was a God controlling the, all his, uh, his acts and had the power to bring him down to his knees. M maybe at a time like this, if our own government officials from our prime minister downward, if they had have thrown themselves on the mercy of God instead of trying to resolve all the problems that we have in their own strength, Maybe if they had thrown themselves immediately on the mercy of God, could this pandemic possibly have been gone by now? I don't know. 
but I do believe that our God is as gracious and merciful today as he has always been. And when people set aside their own personal pride, their own self-sufficiency, and throw themselves upon the mercy of God, as it has been proved in this precious book time and time again, our God has shown himself to be a God of mercy. Something perhaps to think about. But you see, the world that we are living in today, is it not true to say, is driven by power. People, and not just government leaders, but wealthy people, you know, pop stars, sports stars, people in general have little or no time for God or his message. People have become, maybe without realizing it, very self-centered, pursuing their own goals. It's a case of, let me get as much as I can out of this life while I can. Is that not where we are today? And many of them see Christians as almost intolerable, especially those Christians who are prepared to stand up and speak the whole counsel of God's word. And the sinful life that people are living today is having a massive impact upon what, at the end of the day, is God's, God's world. Disease has, has become rampant. Natural disasters have become ransomed. The whole, this world's whole ecosystem is slowly but surely being destroyed. Our scientists are constantly warning about global war warming and all the effects that that's going to bring upon us in the not too distant future. But yet many leaders are defiant and they're not listening to these things. But the root cause of all our problems today just as they were in the days of that, this particular pharaoh and in Egypt, lie in the fact that you know, man is, is fundamentally sinful. And even though Jesus and God himself loved this world so much that he sent Jesus to, to be, provide a cure for all the root cause of man's problems and that cure was at the cost of, of our precious sinless Savior dying at Calvary and even though that message is still so faithfully preached and even though the Holy Spirit of God is still as active in convicting men and women of their need of a Savior so so many are still just saying what Pharaoh said, tomorrow will do, tomorrow. People procrastinate and they put off the decision that they know because <coughs> God has spoken very clearly and convicted their conscience. People still turn around and say, tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. But friends, tomorrow never comes. Procrastination is a heinous sin. And once that, the decision is put off, when the conscience is stirred, you can be assured that our arch enemy, the devil, will provide something else tomorrow to grab the attention. And at the end of the day, you know, there is no decision made for Christ. Maybe you are one who is listening me to, to, this, to me speak this message today and maybe you are not saved. Maybe God has spoken to your heart very graciously any number of times in the past. 
You have felt the prick of, the, of your conscience, your, God's words challenging you as to your need of a saviour, and you have said time and time again, tomorrow. I think about it tomorrow. I do something about it tomorrow. How long ago was the first tomorrow? And still you are in the same situation as you were in the first time. My friend, can I give you the most gracious and humble warning? See, what you don't realize is that every time you say tomorrow, your heart is hardening and it's hardening and it's getting harder. And each time the message does not have the same impact, it doesn't seem to be so urgent. And eventually, now this is the great danger in all of this, eventually there is no prick of the conscience. Eventually there is no need to say tomorrow. And in the worst case scenario, tomorrow just doesn't come because you pass out of this scene of time without Christ. Lost. Friends, it's with a very heavy heart, but in love I warn you, if you feel God speaking to you today, do not put this decision off. Jesus is waiting as he has always done, waiting for your word of repentance, waiting for the invitation to come into your heart to save you, to wash away your sin, and to renew you within. I pray that you will do that. Second point, God promises and purposes always come to pass. Always. Bible talks about the fool that rejected Christ and went to a lost eternity. There are many, many, many illustrations to prove this, but surely this Pharaoh stands out as one of the worst of them. And he said, tomorrow, when his people were crying out for immediate relief, there wasn't much common sense in that decision, was there? But then sin is a habit of distorting the mind, you see. And it, it causes the mind to reason the whole thing out from a, and, and see it from a totally different perspective. But look carefully what Moses, was repl what Moses' reply was after Pharaoh said tomorrow. Moses said, be it according to thy word. In other words, it's your free choice. But he went on to say that you may know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And as we read on, we see that God fulfilled his promise because in verse 13, the frogs were taken away. The people gathered them up into heaps and the whole land was stinking with dead frogs. This, this whole situation, you know, a free choice, it needs to be considered very, very carefully because this sin at the present day is, is a never-increasing problem. The first plague that, as I said, was sent was turning the water into blood. But brothers and sisters, I want you to understand what was really going on here. And I want you to be encouraged by this. You see, God had made a promise to deliver his people from the, the, the slavery and bondage. God made that promise and God honored that promise. You know, when you read the rest of the story as it progresses through Exodus. Despite the best determined efforts of Pharaoh, God eventually broke that man down. 
And brothers and sisters, today, despite the most determined efforts of our arch enemy, the devil, God will win in the end. Trust him. Trust him. God is going to bring us safely to, to glory. And again, if you're unsafe today, I would say to you, if you are prepared to take the, the, the step of faith that the rest of us took in the past, you too will come on to the winning side. If you're not prepared to listen to the message of God, God's word, if you're not prepared to take that step of faith, my friend, you are going to end up on the losing side. And the harsh reality of being on the losing side is eternal destruction. If you follow this, the, the, these plagues through and what happened afterwards at the Red Sea when the children of Israel were brought through on dry land to the, to the other side, which is a beautiful picture of how God takes believers through to heaven. And Pharaoh tried to follow with all his mighty forces and the waters engulfed them and they were destroyed. That, my friends is a perfect picture of the destruction of evil at the end of this age and what's going to happen to those who would not listen to the call of God and of Christ. God has given us in the New Testament concerning our own eternal future so many promises because Jesus rose from, from death itself, that last great enemy was defeated. Jesus became what Paul writes about as the, in, in the book of Corinthians, the first fruits of the resurrection. And see, that's why we as believers have such a blessed hope. We know that we can trust him implicitly and we can trust in the finished work of Christ. So what's the sense then of saying tomorrow when you can win the victory today? In my own mind, it's totally illogical. The great old American evangelist pre preacher Billy Sunday said, tomorrow is a soft couch upon which multitudes lie down and never awake. Procrastination, irresolution, idleness, weakness of character, pride are all milestones along that great highway of failure which leads to the, 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 the great precipice. And if you keep on saying tomorrow, it's only a matter of time until you reach the precipice then it will be too late, too late. Can I just bring the, our thoughts to a close here with one final point, and that is God calls his people to serve him. Because you see, it's not just the message that Pharaoh heard from Moses and Aaron. It it's centers around what I should say is, is what, what Moses and Aaron had to say, let me, my people go that they may serve me. That was God's word to Pharaoh. Let my people go. And that call extends to each one of us today. Because is it not true to say, as it was in those days, you know, there's a tendency especially for believers to get too much embroiled in the things of this world, is there not a tendency when the call comes to serve, Lord, not just now, Lord, tomorrow. Lord, I am so busy at the minute with the, the things that are going on in my life. I'm sure you won't mind if I just put off those, those works of service for a little while. Friends, People are perishing every single day. 
people are passing out into a lost eternity. God's call is as urgent on our lives as it was on the lives of, of the children of Israel in their day. God said through Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. And that is the call that's on the life of every Christian today, that they may serve me. Brothers and sisters, I hope and pray that you have not been putting off God's call upon your life. I hope and pray that you will never do what Pharaoh did because it was an act of complete arrogance and he said, tomorrow. God, through my simple fact, faculties, is saying to you today, this is the day. This is the day that I need you now while it is still light to, to serve me in this world. So my question is, will you respond to his call? As believers, I pray that we will be ready and willing to take up the, the torch and, and, and the service of our blessed Savior. Consider that when he came to this earth and it came to the time for him to go to the cross, did he ever for one minute consider, you know, Lord, put it off till tomorrow? Not at all. Jesus was resolute. The Bible says he set his face like a flint, which is one of the hardest rocks to go to the cross. And he did, and he did not flinch in any way. He paid the full price of our salvation, praise his holy name. And brothers and sisters, I pray that you are prepared to pay a very small price for to serve him and, and return even in a small token his love that he first showed for us. Sinner friend, my preaching is done. This message is over. Except for my last question to you. Today, through the, the power of this precious book, God calls you one more time. What is your answer going to be? God calls you to come to the cross, to come to Jesus, to repent of your sin, to, to forsake the things of this world which are only passing away, and to accept him as your saviour. Now, what is your answer going to be? I pray that it's not going to be tomorrow. It's my honest prayer and loving prayer that your answer will, answer will be, yes, Lord, today I'll come. Let us pray. Father, I just thank you for your word today. And as I think back to all those years ago when that arrogant Pharaoh said tomorrow, I just pray, Father, for all who who will listen to this message and watch this video that are unsaved. I pray, Father, that your spirit would put it into their hearts to say, yes, Lord, I'll come today. I'll come right now. I'll come as I am. And because I know, Father, that my blessed Savior will accept them and gloriously save them. And Father, for my brothers and sisters, I pray that they too will not shun the call to come and serve, but that they will willingly say, Today, Lord Jesus, I give you my all, for you art worthy. I pray this prayer in the, his precious name and for his sake. May his be the glory. Amen. And now as we close our, our service, friends, we will sing the hymn.
And now we, we simply come to the end of our time together and we, we close with the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our portion this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>